Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Lacona Pops webinar. Open your doors to pass the programming and exhibits. Um, just for your reference, the POP, um, POP stands for Programs, Outreach, and Promotions. Um, my, my name is Roz Topolsky, and I am your host for this afternoon. I am the Community Engagement Programming Coordinator at the Vernon Area Public Library in Lincolnshire, and I'm also the Secretary for the Lacona POP Board. And on behalf of the entire board, we want to thank you for attending today. We're going to hear from three speakers, um, Stephanie Driscoll, who is the Creative Services Librarian at the Chapam at the Schomburg Township District Library. Then we will hear from Wanta Griffin, who is a multicultural learning coordinator at the Oak Park Public Library. And then we are going to hear from Rhonda Ruffin, who is the information services manager at the Glenwood Linwood Library. So again, we are recording today's session. You will receive a link from us in the next couple of days with a link to the recording along with all the slides. So you can perhaps share them with some of your colleagues who may, would be interested in hearing about today's topic, maybe couldn't join us. Please put your questions in the Q&A um, this afternoon and we will take questions for all three speakers at the conclusion of their portions. So um, just you can you know, put them into the Q&A or the chat as you think of them, but we will take questions at the end. So now I'd like to welcome Stephanie Driscoll. Stephanie, if you want to join us, uh, here we go. And um, we're really excited to hear from you about your work with, um, with passive programming and exhibits um, at, at Schaumburg. So welcome, Stephanie. Hello, everybody. So let me share my screen here. All right. Okay, so I am Stephanie Driscoll. I'm the Creative Services Librarian at the Schomburg Library. And I am going to talk a little bit about how to start up exhibits at your library when you haven't really done it before. You may not know what the first steps are and you definitely do not have an exhibits budget yet. So um, some background for everybody. This was the creative services position was a new position that was created um, about five years ago. So what I do, I'm in charge of our large scale all ages events at the library. So think like summer challenge, one book, Comic-Con, um, and then also our exhibits. So when I first started five years ago, Schomburg had not really done any exhibits, but you can see from this photo, they had just redone um, our first floor. And so this is our commons area. And so they had intentionally created this space with movable furniture pieces, um, movable book racks so that it could be, um, so everything could get out of the way and that it would be an open and welcome space to start hosting those exhibits. Um, so the first thing that I want to touch on and what I think trips up a lot of people when we're thinking about bringing exhibits to um, our libraries is what are we defining as an exhibit? So in this picture is the exhibit that we have right now at our library. And I think this is kind of what people's minds go to when we talk about exhibits. So this is Thomas Edison's Secret Lab. It's a rental from the Betty Brin's Children's Museum um, in Milwaukee. And this exhibit is huge and crazy and loud. And I get like 10 emails a day about like noise and missing pieces and people drawing all over it. But our patrons love it. Um, but it's taken our library like five years to get here to hosting this sizable thing. And what I want to point out too is that like for a lot of libraries, this is just never going to be doable, right? Like this is um, full disclosure probably about it was a four month ex exhibit rental for about $42,000. Um, Schomburg's a well-funded library. We have um, a sizable exhibit budget now, but this isn't where we started. So I wanna take you through kind of how we got here, right? Um, so I'm gonna show you some DIY exhibits that we've done in the past and that we still do, because it's important to think about exhibits as something that your library can create entirely on their own. Um, and that it's something to educate and engage patrons with. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. The goal should just be to start that engagement piece. 
Um, then I'm going to share some resources and furniture pieces that we've invested in that have really helped us pop up these DIY exhibits anywhere in our library. Um, and, and some ways that we, some tools that we have used to measure engagement. Last, I'll talk a little bit about um, our experience with grants and how going after those grants kind of gave us the stories and statistics to put together um, kind of the, to prove that the exhibits were worthwhile to our patrons. So we're gonna start off with some simple DIY exhibits. You can see the picture on the left. Um, so these were both for Women's History Month. The picture on the left is probably, I've seen this, I copy this exhibit from, you know, just Googling it. So these, um, you can see this a lot of places. So I just convinced my manager to buy a mannequin, which we have weirdly used a ton for lots of random stuff. Um, so just throwing a Schomburg Library t-shirt on them, creating um, a skirt made out of um, famous author, women authors, book covers, um, and then just popping up that library cart next to it, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the picture on the right is an exhibit that I just created this year for Women's History Month. This one uh, was kind of neat because it was very personal to Schomburg. I worked with our local history librarian who was able to access tons of old photos about famous women from Schomburg. So we have um, a photo here from like the 1850s of the first, uh, it was a woman who opened up the first like Schomburg general store. Um, and then we also have obviously more current photos. And then our claim to fame is that Sherry Shepard from The View went to Hoffman Estates High School. So we also featured her. Um, this next one is a poster display that we had from the 9-11 Memorial Museum. I'll talk about free posters in a minute as well, but we added a component to it where we just used one of our blank walls and just asked people to share the memories of where they were when they first heard the news. Um, and so you can see we got a lot of responses. This whole wall was, was full of these post-it notes um, and something as simple as this people were really open with sharing their stories and loved um, not only sharing their stories, but also gave us great feedback that they loved reading about other people's stories as well. Um, and I just wanna add in a tip here for people who are already looking at this and being like, well, this wouldn't work because people at our library like don't participate in things like this. I always, whenever I'm doing anything like this, putting out an interactive thing where I'm wanting people to participate or doing a guest book, I always cheat. And like the first couple are always from me. I'll, you know, sign different names to it, but just trying to get people over that like intimidation factor that they're going to be the first ones to put that out there. Um, so that's like a little tip that you can do to try and like spur that engagement early on. Um, one of our last easy DIY setups was just during Comic-Con, we moved our furniture out of the lobby and just set up tons of tables and chairs. Um, and just on our big TV right there, we just um, played nonstop drawing videos for our two week Comic-Con. Um, and it was great. People would just sit down and just start drawing things. Kids especially loved it. And it was a great thing for parents to sit down and do with their kids. And it only, I mean, these drawing videos were like, a minute long each, right? Before it would go on to the next one. Um, so that was a super easy thing. And plus when we do these kind of pop-up things, we're always trying to tie it into something bigger. So even though we felt like we were screaming about our Comic-Con and all of our marketing stuff, um, plenty of people came to the library and had no idea that we were doing this two week long thing. And it, was in, it wasn't until, you know, they walk in, they see the space, they are wondering what these drawing videos are, that they're really being like, oh, I had no idea that you were even doing that. Um, okay, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about some tools that we have used that are super um, helpful. So one of the most important things to remember, especially if your exhibit doesn't have um, any built-in hands-on components of it, is that you'll need to build that in. Um, I would stress that every exhibit that you're putting up, whether it's like a simple art show or a poster display, there always has to be some sort of participatory element to it. So obviously one of the easiest ways to do this is um, by having books available to be checked out right next to your pop-up space. So this first thing um, in the top left corner here, this is one of our, what we call our pop-up library cart. Um, I really like this. It's great for like putting in, like, cause a lot of people don't have dedicated exhibit spaces. So this is great 
um, because you're sort of making your own little exhibit space against a pole or in a corner or somewhere that you can just sort of make a space out of nothing. I like this cart a lot because um, it's on wheels, obviously, but it also folds close, so it makes a perfect square and it has a flat surface on top, which you'll find is really nice for putting like extra engaging materials on top that you want people to interact with. Um, so the one next to this, really simple, just clear ballot boxes. These are simple to buy, they're, they're pretty big. We have two of them. And like for Women's History Month, we'll just ask people to, we'll have some trivia out and ask people to turn it in. And like, I'm not even offering anything. There's no prizes, you get nothing if you do this. But for some reason, people see a thing, they wanna fill it out. They wanna see if they got the right answers. Um, or we'll do two ballot boxes right next to each other and then just ask a simple question and have people vote and then give them a bunch of tokens. And then they're just, um, putting their choice in one or the other of the ballot boxes. The next thing is called Mila walls. Um, these are great. These are um, walls that are meant to be movable, put up, taken down very easy. It takes about two people to put them together. When you don't need them, they can lay flat. They can be stacked up against each other. So we have 10 Mila walls. I believe we bought 10 of them for $7,000 you can, you, you don't have to buy 10, you can buy less. We always set them up in two groups of five. They can be set up in, in a bunch of different formations, but this is great for when you don't have that exhibit space or you do have a space, but it's off in a corner. So you're not really getting that patron interaction right when they come in. So like we'll use these and just put them up in the middle of our lobby to kind of create um, a room and, and create walls where we need them so that people when they first walk in have to um, interact with that exhibit. For the, you don't have money for walls, the next best thing, easels. They're super simple. You just go, um, this is what I use for the women's history exhibit. I just pop these up all over the commons and people you're sort of making an exhibit space where they can just walk through. Post-it notes, of course, go a long way. You're just asking a question and then just putting those down for people just to fill out their answer and then stick them up on that wall space. Um, and then probably the most helpful tool is just a three ring binder. You're just gonna put it out with every exhibit that you do and you're gonna say um, kind of like, what's your feedback? We've tried fancier things. We've tried the kiosk iPad system where we're like, give her a smiley face or a sad face. Um, and that just did not work as well. With that guest book, you get really great quotes. You get people who are taking the time to really write what so moved them about your art piece, or you get people who like are really angry about it. But either way, it's it's really good um, feedback. And I would say the guest book more than anything else has allowed us to take all those quotes. And then that's what we're putting in um, our board reports to kind of make that message that this is a worthwhile investment um, and something that should be, we should spend um, effort on. So an easy way to first dip your toe into this are poster exhibits. So this, um, it's called CITES, Smithsonian Institution Traveling Ex Exhibition Service. So you're literally just gonna type in CITES into Google um, and it's free poster exhibits on tons of different topics. So you are going to get on their mailing list because that's a really helpful way to be, they'll notify you of upcoming exhibits. So if it's upcoming, you can get on the list and they'll actually send you the pre-made posters in the mail. If you are looking at something in the past, they'll, you'll just download the files and you can have, you can print those off yourself. Um, this is a really good just beginner way to start highlighting different topics. You can, um, some tips that we've learned with these is, you know, talk to your marketing department and just something as easy as um, printing these out and then backing them on foam core to make them, it looks a little bit more sturdy, a little bit more professional. And then you can sort of either hang these on the wall and there's a little bit more um, weight to them, or you can put these on the easels if they have that foam core to them. So that's kind of the, if you've never done anything, it's kind of an easy way um, to get into this. Um, so then just quickly about grants, right? Like there's no, I can't give you any special thing to like magically get grants. I will say 
um, through what we've done that the first application is the hardest application because you're you're really trying to get all of this information together. You um, really don't want to spend, because grants take time, so you really don't want to apply for grants that aren't made for your library. If it's asking, if it's telling you that these grants are for small rural libraries and that's not you, I wouldn't waste your time applying for it. Um, you really want to you know, make the case about why this grant would work for you. So you're really going to want all of your census data and really what these grants want, a lot of these places that have made um, these exhibits is they want eyes on it. So your marketing data is also really valuable to have to show, you know, we're going to put this in our newsletter, which gets mailed out to these amount of homes. Um, we're going to put this on our website, which has this many clicks. Um, so things like that. Before we got our exhibit budget, we got grants. So we got the ALA Thinking Grant, Thinking Money Grant twice, um, which was very nice, smaller, like pop-up exhibits, very easy. Um, so that was kind of our first getting our feet wet into kind of exhibits. Um, and then we got the Bias Inside Us exhibit from the Smithsonian, which took up two floors. And that was um, a grant as well. And um, the thing about grants is because we hadn't explored exhibit yet, so this was kind of our way in to prove to our board to kind of start getting that and asking for that exhibit budget. Um, so if you don't have a budget yet, grants are a great way to start trying to go down um, that path. So that was a lot of information. Um, it's just simple things that you can start out with. Um, the poster displays, always trying to do anything you can, have a little bit of that participatory um, point to it. And also I would recommend always put out a guest book. That's, you're getting great feedback from there. This is, uh, I just included a picture. This is from our Thomas Edison. So the guest book is more geared towards kids that are writing in it. And those are like cute and adorable. And like document every exhibit that you're putting out. Even if you don't think it's a big deal, even if it's small, take pictures of it and put out that guest book because that's how you're going to start um, building your case. And then that's also great just that for your own portfolio to look back on and see, okay, so this is what I did last year for Women's History Month. Um, here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. Here's what we could have done more of. So I, I would just say really document and put out that guest book and then just start getting that feedback from your patrons. Um, I have my contact info at the bottom, asdriscoll at stdl.org. I will, am more than happy to answer any questions. Um, so if you have a specific thing you want to email me about, otherwise I will stay on and help answer any questions that you guys have. Thanks for listening. Sunny, thank you so much. That was, that was so helpful. I took lots of notes myself. I love that you got a chance to share some really simple things with us that any of us can do. That was wonderful. So, um, yeah, so please stick around. I'm sure we'll have some questions for you um, at the end of the program. So um, now we are going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Wanta Griffin with the Oak Park Public Library. And hi, Wanta. <laughs> hi. Um, so Wanta's going to be telling us about um, their experience with Passive programming, this really great concept they have called Idea Box, and how they've been able to translate some of these principles into either their, their, their other branches that don't have, you know, an ideal exhibit space. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to you if you want to try sharing your screen. Are you able to see it? Uh, not yet.
There we go. Uh, yes, I thought you wanted, then you just want to select slideshow um, in the upper right corner. Ah, perfect. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera off and I'm going to turn things over to you. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> Okay, hi. Well, my name is Wanda Griffin. I'm the Multicultural Learning Coordinator at the Oak Park Public Library, and I'd like to share the idea box with you. Well, the idea box is, the idea box is a space located in the foyer of the Oak Park Public Library branch. It's used uh, to promote awareness of multicultural holidays and events to uh, marginalized people groups to utilize uh, and empower marginalized people groups by lending them space to create, to build, or just be. The Idea Box is a community resource and it has, it's used to connect patrons with social services uh, such as mental health resources, food insecurities, uh, such as to, it's used for like Overdose Awareness Month and Beyond Hunger. The Idea Box was designed for the community and the space, it changes monthly or bi-monthly. Oh, go back. So, well, some of the guidelines for the idea box, but well, we really don't have a lot of guidelines for the idea box because it is a community space. Um, it's more like it's guided by equity. So it's, what the organizers need. It's need-based uh, is what we use. So in the room, it's gallery style and the organizers of, of the event or of the exhibit will ask, you know, they'll tell us what they need in that space. And then we'll try to, they communicate those needs and we try to meet them where they are. Uh, patrons really enjoy things like using the instruments um, in the room, like we've had Black History Month exhibits in there where there have been uh, West African instruments. Uh, they enjoy leaving the names of their loved ones on altars for Dia de Muertos, uh, coloring sheets. Um, I've received feedbacks on music and the smell of the room. I've sometimes, uh, I put plugins in there so there are different smells, games that are in the rooms. Uh, they enjoy uh, anything that's engaging in the room with each other. It doesn't take a lot of money to, um, for patrons to enjoy the space that's in there as long as there's engaging activity and there's um, something for them to do, that's pretty much all they need. It doesn't take a lot of money for people to enjoy passive for programming. Um, how do I identify partners in the community? Well, I'm involved, I've been in my community since 1976, so I'm involved heavily in uh, what goes on in Oak Park. So by going to different things, I pretty much know a lot of people in my community. They will reach out to me via email, or there's a form online that they can fill out if they'd like to do something in the idea box. But pretty much people just reach out to me or by telephone or by email and say they have an idea. They want to use the idea box to celebrate uh, something that's in their heritage or something that's going on in the community. Uh, when there was a, we've had a Stop Asian Hate um, exhibit in our idea box and they wanted to voice that. So it's pretty much giving the community a voice, giving marginalized people a voice. It's making sure that the community has a voice in the community, in the library. So they are a part of what goes on in our library. And when people feel like they're a part of the library and they're part of the community, they're more apt to use the library and come into the library. So that's what it's for. Uh, we measure our engagement by program reflection forms, team meetings, patron surveys, and anecdotal reflections. Again, our community and our library pretty much work hand in hand. This is a video. <laughs> Hello, my name is Raleigh. I'm a librarian and I'm invited to create an altar for Day of the Dead here at the Oak Park Public Library. So I would like to show you guys. This is our idea box installation for Day of the Dead different elements here like food like 
earlobes, lights, skeletons that are traditional. And there's two ways that patrons could submit names to. They could do it in writing or they could submit pictures and names and we'll go ahead and display them on the open right here. Thank you. So during the Day of the Dead, uh, for that particular altar at our main library, patients were able to come into the library, come into the, that particular altar at the main library, put their loved one's name on the altar. They were able to sit in the room with the altar, interact with it. They're, they were able to submit a photograph of their loved one and have it on the screen and just be in the space with the altar. Also, there were at our other two branches of the library, there were two other altars that were made and some of those were um, community based also. So one of the most, uh, well, one of the moving things about the altar was when um, the community members were to brought flowers to the altar and they were bringing things to the altar for the other two altars like when they get involved with the altars. That's always been like uh, something that's very rewarding about um, those, uh, that particular um, program is that when the community takes ownership and they're invested and they bring things uh, to the altars and Day of the Dead. You don't need um, an idea box to do this kind of program. You just need a window or a space. As you can see in these two photographs, this is just an altar that was built. Uh, these are community members, the photographs of uh, community members that are on the altar. This. Both of these were doing COVID. This is the height of COVID, uh, the one on the left and the one on the right. And they're both in our smaller branches. This one uh, on the, well, the one on the left is at our smaller branch and the one on the left is at Dole, as I, is at Maine. And so it's just showing that you don't need an idea box to make a passive program or to make an altar at your library, that you can do this anywhere in very low budget. You don't even need, uh, a room. You just need a table, decorations, and a relationship with your community. Again, we have uh, the mayor in a neighboring town who is from Galveston, Texas, and he had a lot of Juneteenth memorabilia. And he donated it for a while to our library for us to display it at our idea box. And what you see here is memorabilia from Galveston, Texas for Juneteenth. And we were able to showcase that during uh, COVID. There's also a monitor behind the, the window. And so patrons could come and watch the video. That's me reading the proclamation for Juneteenth in our town. The first year that we had uh, recognized Juneteenth as a holiday in our village. And it's just me reading the proclamation and people could come by and they could hear the reading. They could read the other um, materials from Juneteenth and the original materials from Galveston, Texas. And that's one way you could do an exhibit with very little money, almost zero budget. So it is, if you include your community, if you include your community in your passive programming, sometimes you can do a passive program on something like a coin collection. If someone in your community has a coin collection, and they want to come in and say, hey, I'd like to share my coin collection. You create a game or a bingo or something. They share the coin collection. You're now like connecting these coins to like, you know, different currency from around the world. You've opened up the space. You have a table. Boom, program done. And everyone's enjoying it. This program is around Ramadan. And this woman, uh, does this program every year, again, creating relationships between the library and the community. She comes in, she does this display. Because of COVID, we have to close the door. And so we um, patrons will come in, everything is labeled on the table. Everything is labeled for people to see and know what it is. They can read about it. There's literature, there are items and artifacts. And 
classrooms come and they view these displays. And this particular teacher comes every year, this is her second year. And she called me ahead of time and she told me she was coming. And I called the woman who created this display and she came and she read a book for the, the students uh, when, they were, when they were seated there. And that was just really special, just creating relationships, creating opportunities for engagement while um, learning about cultures from around the world. Again, I'm the multicultural coordinator, so I curate a collection of 1,001 artifacts around the world. And so using what our library has to engage with the community and teach global citizenship has always been a goal of, of the Oak Park Public Library. So for Black History Month, um, we created a museum in our library. Um, the closest museum that we have to Chicago is the uh, Black History Museum to Chicago is the DuSable Museum. And so we thought it would be interesting to create a sort of DuSable Museum within Oak Park. And so we invited a woman from the, a neighboring community who had a large collection of Black memorabilia we married it with our collection of black artifacts. And she had things like the original Joe Lewis boxing gloves. She had um, quilts that were over a hundred years old. She had um, just game boards and Mancala games and just different things, um, artifacts and first edition books and lots of different things, um, dolls um, that were made by enslaved people. She had different things to share with the community learning tools. And so we were able to open our library and share historical things. And when we did that, different community members came like and brought things like this balafon you see before, it's a West African instrument. That's also um, um, an instrument that's used by griots in, in West Africa and there are Kora instruments and different instruments. So we were able to use those as teaching tools and have uh, children interact with them and one of the most um, uh, engaging pictures that I see right here is there's a mom who's nursing her child who's watching her other two children play Mancala in the space. And they were there for about 30 minutes just engaging and um, playing a, a West African um, board game while just being with her family in the library, just spending time with the library. And I thought that was pretty amazing. And over here, there's a, a patron learning about a djembe uh, which is a West African drum and everything is labeled. So patrons are free to move around in this space and learn about all of these artifacts um, at will. And it takes uh, either, you can open the space and they can move around freely and just learn about all the artifacts. So that's one program that we really enjoyed. And again, this is just using things that we have. Um, lots of the displays that are in this room was just me and my colleague uh, running around the library, borrowing things from different spaces, like <laughs> that bookshelf wasn't being used. And there were things that weren't being used that we had in storage. And we just kind of brought them together to create this display. Uh, nothing was uh, nothing was ordered or new. It was just us putting things that we already owned in our library together to create a museum uh, for Black History Month and using our community members to make this happen. And so that's what it looked like when we finished uh, using um, everything in the room was things that our library already owned. Oh, we did buy spray paint and a lot of spray paint. So <laughs> the uh, black um, pillars that you see behind you used to be like some kind of psychedelic silver and we spray painted them black for, for this um, display. And uh, that carpet was like rolled up in a closet somewhere, I believe, and those bookshelves were just in circulation. So we did borrow things from everywhere uh, to make this uh, happen for Black History Month. This was uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. And again, because these are artifacts that we have in our collection. So everything in this picture is labeled and Patrons can come by and see what um, that dress on the side I know is from Guatemala and everything in this picture is like the country of origin is on it. The books are all labeled. And if you want to, you can um, check these artifacts out of the library. Everything in the multicultural collection 
uh, patrons are able to check them out of the library and examine them with their families and discuss them with their families. So it's like not just um, for the exhibit, they're also, if they have a barcode on them, families can check them out, schools can check them out, teachers can check them out. If they're for everyone to uh, learn about them at home, we encourage uh, people to learn about multicultural education at home and in our school system as well. Teachers can call and call ahead and um, have engagement with the, um, with the artifacts at our library as well. So multicultural education and passive programming can kind of go hand in hand with little to no budget. And um, that's how we do it at our library. And we thank you very much for having us. I want to thank you so much. I, I just love this project and <laughs> it's done so beautifully. Um, and I really appreciate all the different examples that you shared. Thank you. So, Stick around. I'm going to turn, you, want to, you can turn your microphone and camera, but stick around because we'll, want you, we'll ask you to come back in a few minutes as soon as we're done with our, our final speaker. So our final speaker is Rhonda Ruffin, who is the Information Services Manager at the Glenwood Linwood Library. And Rhonda is going to be talking about a really kind of popular program these days called a kind of tiny art show. A lot of libraries have been experimenting with um, as a way to bring patrons into their building. And so we are going to hear about Rhonda's experience. Uh, so I'm going to pull up your slides real quick. Okay. So I'm going to turn things over to you. All right. Thanks, Roz. Hello, everybody. Uh, like Roz said, a lot of libraries are experimenting uh, with tiny art shows. And uh, this is something that we decided to do during COVID. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about our experience doing it. We are a small library in the South suburbs. So uh, we like to do things uh, in a low budget way. Uh, but um, I'll tell you about our experiences and and uh, what we did, what we learned, and uh, would we do it again? And again, uh, next slide, Ross. Thanks. Uh, I'm Rhonda Ruffin. I'm the Information Services Manager at the Glenwood Linwood Library. I've been in this role. I had to look when I put this this slide together. I didn't really realize I've been in this role for ten years. I've been at the library for uh, 15 years uh, and um, working in a small public library, you wear a lot of hats. Uh, for those 10 years, I've been on and off responsible for um, programming for all ages at our library. I have a staff that are the creative ones uh, occasionally, I will dip my toe in planning something creative, but I'm not a creative type myself. So uh, most of the programming that I do is um, coordinating. So uh, I was online and, and saw people talking about doing this type of program. And I said, hey, why not? Our patrons might enjoy it. Next slide, Ross. So again, I said, uh, why a tiny art show? I'll talk a little bit about why we did it, how we did it, what we would do differently. And again, uh, would we do it again? Uh, Roz mentioned, and I'll mention too, that we, uh, as libraries, I, I won't say steal, we steal from one another. Uh, and uh, when you, um, Google or look on any programming websites, uh, you look at some things that uh, your library might do that your patrons would enjoy. You know, we're in the thick of COVID. I mean, it's still going on, although we, some people say post COVID, we really aren't there yet. And our patrons aren't there yet. So uh, we decided uh, to do more um, passive programming initially. Uh, because they just have not returned into the pre-pandemic uh, numbers that we, uh, we saw before. So we said we have a lot of creative patrons and this would give them the opportunity to uh, participate in something that was not virtual because our patrons hate virtual programming with a passion. 
So we still wanted to bring them into the library, but for those who weren't comfortable, they could come back in. Next slide, please. Uh, like I said before, uh, it allowed all patrons to participate. We, um, most of our patrons that participate in our creative programs were adults, but we wanted to see the kids come back into the library also. Uh, we wanted them to give them the ability to uh, display their completed artwork for their friends and families to see. We've done programs in the past uh, where we did gingerbread houses, we created storybooks, we, uh, and those programs that are the more popular ones are the ones where people can uh, have their, their work displayed and uh, patrons come in and vote on them or they can come in and show their families what they've created. Um, we have a ready-made display when we did this program. Uh, every month we're uh, coming up with different things to uh, display for our patrons to stop and, and pay attention to. We don't have a large space to do that. We have a display case that's divided into thirds and we have the tops of some of our bookcases. Uh, but we don't have a lot of display areas. So uh, this tiny art show represented uh, an opportunity to uh, display works that we didn't have to come up with. Um, like I said, again, uh, this was a passive program that um, during COVID allowed our creative patrons who came to almost everything we did uh, to, that was creative to be able to pick it up, take it home, complete it and bring it back. So for those who weren't quite comfortable in returning to the library uh, the way they uh, had before, this represented an opportunity for them to still participate in programming because people really are keep saying, I didn't know you were open. I didn't know you were back. Are you guys doing programming? Yes, we are. So we wanted to give them the opportunity to dip their toes in and actually uh, do some programming. And uh, as Roz and I were talking about this presentation, uh, she brought up the point and I agreed with her that uh, we want our patrons to return to the library and a program like this gives them multiple opportunities to come back into the library. They come in to pick up their kit, uh, they come to return it, they come uh, to vote on um, the, their artwork as it's displayed and they have to come and pick it up too. Uh, and I'll talk about that too, because that was pretty interest, interesting. Um, I, I do want to touch on too, the fact that uh, we decided to do uh, the Tiny Art Show because uh, as a lot of other libraries did, we all uh, joined that bandwagon of creativity I mean, who didn't do uh, adult coloring? Who didn't do paint and sip? Uh, so, you know, Tiny Art Show was just the next inter, uh, iteration of uh, um, creativity for not just adults, but all of our creative patrons. Next slide, please. How did we do it? Uh, well, like I said, uh, during COVID, I spent a lot of time on Facebook. That's how we communicated with our patrons about what was going on at the library. Prior to COVID, we didn't do as much posting, but Facebook gave us the opportunity to tell people what we were doing, um, when our hours changed, um, you know, to highlight programming and spotlight it and just to communicate with those patrons who uh, didn't know what was going on with us. Uh, in addition to programming, we did a lot of community posting too. And one of the groups that I joined was the Programming Library Interest Group um, to uh, see what was out there that other libraries were doing. Um, staff wasn't always in the building at the same time. So we didn't get a chance to network and brainstorm like we did before. So I just wanted to check out what other people were doing. So uh, I recommend that site. We uh, talk about 
different, uh, different ideas that are presented and whether or not they would work at our library. Um, we publicized the event in our newsletter once I decided to go ahead with it. And on Facebook, like I said before, we are an Amazon library. Uh, I don't know what we did before uh, Amazon and Walmart, but we're always there. And on that uh, interest group site, um, uh, staff had posted what they used and we varied it a, a little bit to fit our needs. And we often uh, try to reuse what we already have. Uh, we didn't have uh, a lot of the supplies, but we did have paint. Like I said before, we were a, a paint and sip library. So we had lots and lots of acrylic paint. So we were able to reuse that. Uh, we distributed the kits and supplies and rules, um, which we bought from Amazon. And really, we hope for the best. We'd never done it before. We did not know if our patrons would respond to it. Next slide, please. Amazon supplies, uh, like I said, that's what we bought uh, that was suggested to the right. Those little four by four uh, canvases, they came with easels, which we did send home with patrons. Um, you can do that or not. Uh, we just had to hope that they returned them. I probably wouldn't send them home again. Uh, but everybody who returned artwork did return the easel, so we were fortunate in that regard. To the left are those paint pots. Some people had uh, like condiment cups. We've used those for other programs, and we found that when we uh, put the paint in early, it would dry out. We didn't want that to happen, so we bought those paint pots and with this particular purchase, it came with uh, two uh, brushes for each of the paint pots so that um, you know, patrons were able to have that available if they didn't already. But what we did was with the tons of creative, uh, the acrylic paint that we had, uh, when patrons came to pick up the supplies, that's when we filled the paint pots. So, uh, they just waited a, a couple minutes for us to do that. We had it in our work area ready to go. And uh, so we were able to uh, do that and send them home with uh, supplies that weren't dried out. Uh, next slide, please. That's the publicity we use to the left is our newsletter. Um, we didn't know what we were doing. We uh, put it in the newsletter. And like I said, we hope for the best. Uh, we gave them a month to come in and pick up the supplies and to create their artwork. And we, uh, in our newsletter, we said, okay, bring it back in at the beginning of April and we will have a show on the 6th. We have had art shows before. It was, it was from uh, local schools who created our work. And so we felt that we could uh, just invite everybody back to the library to see it at one time, which didn't work, but we'll talk about that later. We uh, promoted it on our Facebook page. Uh, we actually thought uh, in our display that we would include little figurines and uh, like someone was going to a gallery to see the artwork. We ended up not doing that at the last minute, but uh, we took that picture off the internet and said, yeah, maybe we'll display them like that in our display case. And to the right is, uh, we have a graphic uh, artist on staff and um, we really had not thought about uh, exactly what we were going to tell people to do. We wanted to give them a, a lot of latitude uh, to be as creative as they could without, uh, you know, trying to inhibit their creativity. But we did give them a, a little bit of guidance. If you noticed on the previous side with this with the supplies, we uh, actually only uh, distributed twenty, although we had twenty four canvases. 
uh, some of our staff um, uh, painted some of the artwork, like uh, one of our previous presenters said, you know, to get the ball rolling, uh, they displayed theirs. And uh, it, luckily enough, it was our creative staff. So they were pretty good. Uh, I did want to say that for this program, we spent less than $50. Um, because we, uh, as a small library, we did not want to purchase too much um, in the way of supplies. Uh, so we said 20 would be pretty good. And like I said, we were able to use all of the paint we already had. Um, so between the, the canvases, the easels, the paint pots, and giving each patron um, brushes, two brushes, less than $50. Okay. Next slide, please. And this is, uh, these are bad pictures I took with my cell phone of what was returned. We didn't really expect much. We just really wanted to see if patrons uh, would do uh, some art, would create some art. So as you can see from the pictures, or if you can't see, we had varying degrees of creativity. We had some that were obviously created by children. We had some that adults did. And uh, we took the, I took the pictures through the glass, which I probably should not have done. Uh, but those are the only pictures or uh, some of the only pictures that we had. Uh, but we also displayed them allowed our patrons to come in and vote that particular day, that April 6th date that we gave them uh, to come in and see them. Uh, we didn't have a lot of people come in. So we posted on Facebook instead of just that one date, we would leave the display up for the entire month, hoping that more people would come in and vote. And they did. Um, so they came in, we had a box there for them to pick their favorite, uh, although uh, I took staff creations out because I did not want them uh, to be, they weren't numbered. I took them out for this picture, uh, but I didn't want anybody to vote on them. That's not really fair for staff to win, although they did some great work. Uh, but it, that picture to the right, that one's called Book Explosion. That was the um, artwork that, uh, one first prize. Next slide, please. Okay, what will we do differently? A lot. Uh, now that we know that uh, our patrons responded to it, and in fact, not one of those canvases were returned by patrons that I knew already. We previously had uh, our patrons that would come to all of our uh, programs, as soon as our newsletter was published before COVID, they would go down the list and anything that uh, required them to create, they would sign up for everything. Not one of those canvases were returned by those people. So we did, uh, we were able to reach a group of patrons that we never had before. So that was good. But this, Next time, uh, I think I would create artwork based on a theme. We did not want to limit what we received. We thought doing it the first time, uh, if we limited people that we wouldn't get uh, very many submissions. As it was, we got about half of them back, which was okay for us uh, with our first time. Um, uh, if we do it again, uh, we're hoping that more people would respond to it, especially since people uh, kind of knew what we were talking about now that they came in and voted previously uh, for those who were unfamiliar with tiny art shows. We're hoping that uh, now that they know, they will participate more. Uh, something simple as uh, having the staff label them after they're returned. Uh, people wrote on the back, they painted over it. 
They wrote on the easel, the easel got separated from the artwork. They put it on a piece of paper inside of a plastic bag that I didn't display the plastic bags. So they got separated from the artwork. So it was kind of difficult to uh, match the artwork with the artist. So something simple as after it's returned for staff to uh, prepare a label and stick it on the back so we know who is who. Uh, so um, uh, we won't run into that problem again. Also, as I looked on the um, programming listserv uh, through Rails, someone mentioned awarding more than one prize. If we have more participation, I would love to award more prizes. Uh, I would love to uh, have submissions in different categories, but with the few um, participants we had, it didn't really make sense to do that. But uh, if that happens, that's what we'll do. And uh, someone else also asked, um, would, they, would libraries be open to uh, having patrons use other media besides paint canvas? Uh, we might do that. If it takes off, um, uh, I, I would love to have um, patrons use clay or whatever other media that they may be uh, interested in. And the last thing, and uh, I talked a little bit about this earlier, was to give them an exact date to come and get their artwork. <laughs> because if you see from that previous slide, ah, you can go to the next one. That artwork that's to the right, first of all, yes, we would do it again. Um, we are scheduling it for the holidays. We're going to have patrons come in and pick up their, their uh, materials in November and have them create something on a theme of the holiday theme that will also give us, uh, we have Christmas trees and all kind of holiday, we have a holiday explosion in our library, but this will also have uh, or give us the ability to display their artwork in one of our display cases and not have it have to, to do that ourselves. But if you look at those pictures to the right, those are canvases I still have. Uh, those people return their artwork in April. It is now the end of July and I still have that artwork. Uh, the people we could contact, we did. Those that we couldn't, we put on Facebook, please come in and pick up your artwork uh, when we uh, announce the winner. Uh, and they still haven't done it, which is okay by us. A staff member uh, put it at the top of our DVDs, which circulate pretty well still. Uh, and we have all of those completed canvases uh, on the top of those bookcases. And we won't get rid of them because I think they did a pretty good job. Uh, so we'll leave them up there. And if somebody comes in and says it's, it's theirs, um, we'll give it to them. Um, so that's what those pictures are. Next slide, please. Uh, that's it for my presentation. Uh, uh, thank you for listening. This is what we do at small libraries. We uh, go with what we have. We do it on a budget. And as all of my staff know, I'm pretty cheap. And so, uh, or I can say thrifty. So I like to do things that are low cost. Uh, we don't, we really weren't sure of the level of participation. So it didn't really make sense to spend a lot of money uh, but um, we'll do it again, and we hope that we have greater participation because, again, our patrons still haven't returned to pre-pandemic levels in the library, and they hate virtual programming. So anytime we can do passive programming, for some of them that allows them to take, come in and pick up supplies and take them home, uh, they love to do. So if you have any questions, you can reach me. Uh, at my email, or you can call the library. I'm the only Rhonda here. That's it. <laughs> Rhonda, thank you so much. That sounds like a lot of fun. I know I was, my library is planning the same thing for this winter, so it was really very timely for me personally. Um, so let's see. So if we could have Rhonda, Stephanie, and Juan to all turn on their cameras. 
Um, and I guess Simon, who is my colleague. Hey everybody. <laughs> and Simon's <laughs> going to um, kind of go through some of the questions in the chat and the Q&A, and he'll ask the appropriate person to comment on them. So yeah. All right. I've, thanks, Roz, and thanks, everybody. That was fantastic. So I'll just do this in order. Stephanie, uh, we had a couple questions about where did you buy the pop-up box and where did you buy the, uh, the ballot box, the clear ballot box? Yeah, so the clear ballot boxes, you, I think we got those from display to go, but you, displays to go, but you can also like any, if you Google it, any office supply store, like Office Max Uline too, they all will have, have types of those clear ballot boxes. And then our, what we call our pop-up library book cart, that is from, I, ha, I do have an annoying answer about that. We had that made from Ion Exhibits is where we got that from. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Wanta, we had a few for you. So first one, do you have a list, like a comprehensive list of all the passive programs offered by the Oak Park Library? No, I do not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And the next question is, uh, for exhibits featuring items of high value out in the open, how do you handle liability? Do you have a, an exhibit, do you have exhibitors sign off on or monitor the exhibit in those cases? High value meaning like things? Yeah, I think maybe like the boxing glove, like the, for the Juneteenth, like, did you, do you have... I think maybe that's what the, uh, the, the question. They're locked. So oh, okay. um, those items are locked. So the, there is a display case in the room and we lock it and um, the room is locked. So when we have things that um, the library is responsible for that don't belong to us, we make sure that we lock the door and then patrons can just kind of look from gotcha. the outside. And when they're in the room, they're in the display case and you have to just kind of look at them from the display case. Got it. So they're secured at all times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the last, uh, how do you reach out to all the different community members that have items for your displays? Do you contact organizations, Chamber My of Commerce for help with this? Okay. The funny thing about that is go, I've been on this position for two years only. And when I was first hired, um, it was, I got hired March 16th of 2020, the day the world shut down. And I think my entire community knew before I knew, and I opened my door and there were tons of artifacts at my door of my house. So people were just bringing things to my house and leaving them from their travels from everywhere. And now they just drop them off at the library for me. Um, like if they go there, if they're, I mean, coins and just collections and just everything. Um, I have, there are 54,000 people in Oak Park, but it's still a village. It's, it's still like very small and our library community right. is very, they're very connected. So pretty much I ran for office here. So pretty much everyone kind of like knows who I am and what my position is. So they find me, there is no problem with it. <laughs> good or bad they find they find me and um they get those things to me but i um uh, they can locate me at the library and they can uh at either of all three branches they can drop things off okay so once they knew that you were in that position it was just like a magnet of cultural yeah. artifacts okay they Great. know my house they know yeah. where i work they they drop everything off and sometimes i get emails like i have these i have these shirts from tanzania would you like to use them i get like all these messages and if it's something that I, that's a really hot item like oh yeah i'd love to do a program with that you know i'll call back and or i'll just email if they email me i'll say oh that sounds great can i see it or you know i have i have these beaks that uh percy julian used would you like to have them you know mm, nice. things like that so it's it's a lot of um just really engaging with the community and reaching out to the community. And I never like shy, I'm very accessible to my community. I never um, shy away from communicating with them and meeting with them and, you know, yeah. All right, great. Okay, Rhonda, I've got a, you, some of these you answered uh, in your presentation, but I'll go through them. What was your rate of return on the tiny art kits? Um, I don't know, did you give a specific number to us? How many went out? And so they're wondering how many were not returned. We sent out 20 and uh, okay. 12 actually were returned. Okay. 
Um, so it wasn't that great. Um, it was great for us. We just yeah. didn't know what people would do. So, uh, yeah, it was decent for us. Okay. Uh, and then what kind of rules did you have for your participants of the tiny art show? No rules just to okay. return it by, you know, April 1st, we gave them the, um, the supplies we had, and I've seen on other sites where people uh, gave instructions on how to mix the paint. We didn't do that. We said okay. people <laughs> do what they wanted to do because as a first time program, we didn't really want to restrict, uh, um, you know, or give them a lot of rules because they would say, oh, I can't do that. So we are doing it again, though. So we right. have different rules. Right. It's going to be themed. Yes. I am what and I'm real quick adding them to this. Did, did you have any concerns about content or is it just like if someone returns something that doesn't, you just won't display it? Did exactly. you have any concerns? Okay. Exactly. We did not have any problems with that. Okay. Uh, All right. But if someone had uh, <laughs> submitted something that was inappropriate, it would have just stayed on my desk. Okay. Uh, and then the question, did you have a theme for your tiny art? And you said no, but going forward, you have, you're going to have explicit themes, correct? Yeah, we're, we're planning the holiday one. So yeah. whatever holiday means to uh, the person that's creating it, uh, that's what we want them to do. So they'll all be holiday themed. And hopefully that will invite uh, more participants because, I mean, who doesn't love the holidays? <laughs> And then the last one for everyone, if you could just give a quick uh, uh, answer, do you have an approximate, I, I, I would imagine it depends on the, on the passive program. What is, what is your planning time for a, pa a passive program, if you could quantify it, starting with Stephanie? So it, it just depends. If it's something yeah. that we want in the guide, then we need like six months because that's how <laughs> long we're planning the guide yeah. out. If it's just something that we can pop up, then it, it doesn't matter. If someone has a great idea and we can get it together in a week, then that's all that it takes. So it just depends on how much we're marketing it beforehand, I guess. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And even Rhonda or Wanta, if you have input in this. Well, uh, just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Most of our, our passive programs that are in the idea box are community led. So the community member has right. already gathered materials, already knows where they want to go with it. So when they come into the idea box, they're ready to go. And they usually sign a contract saying they're going to have it done from this day to that date. And it's going to go up and it's usually up for a month or two weeks or whatever. So, and if I'm doing the program, then I have it up in two or three days and it's ready to go. So. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, I have to agree, I think, with Stephanie in that uh, ours had to be included in our newsletter. If it's not in our newsletter, then uh, patrons, a lot of our uh, older patrons don't know about it. Right. So um, I came up with it in December for our newsletter that was uh, planned or that was published in January. Uh, so as long as it's in our newsletter, um, you know, that we can go forward with it. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. And thanks to all the participants. That was fantastic. Uh, and I'll hand it back over to you, Ross, to wrap it up. Thanks, everybody. Right. Um, yeah, I just want to mention one person put an interesting comment in the chat. Already okay. had a tiny art show. And she wrote, or he wrote, I'm not sure who wrote it, um, that there, they have a statement that says, Alice Johnson Live, their, their library reserves the right to remove any inappropriate on artwork based on their discretion. So that could be kind of a, a small item in your um, in the notifications about the Tiny Art Show. Um, so I just want to mention that little that tidbit. Um, anyhow, I just love that we have three different libraries with three very different approaches for engaging their community in different ways. So I hope that everyone found something that was very useful and relevant to their own library and their own community. And uh, Wanda, Stephanie, and Rhonda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for everyone sorry. for joining us. Roz, there was one more, sorry, Roz, there was one more question at the last mm. minute here. Sorry about that. Uh, Stephanie, is it really that hard to get a grant? Uh, other challenges encountered? Oh, so I don't want to act like it's, it's never going to happen. Like, no, apply <laughs> for all, do it. It's great. Yeah. 
um, they, I, my, my biggest, uh, word of advice is just to really like sell yourself in that application. They, they, they have these grants to give out. They want to give them out to people. So just use, you know, your data, your census data, your, what your village is made up of, who you can get to, to participate or who you're trying to reach. Um, it, because a lot of grants are looking for those hard to reach populations. So just um, really pay attention to what they're asking for and sell yourself and then have like five other eyes look it over. <laughs> it would be Thanks. my words of advice. Sorry, Roz. I just no, to- no, no. I'm willing to get the question answered. Absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to sign off. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Bye-bye.